I'm going to start with the first question from last week or two weeks ago. And it was, the question was from, I think it was only lights. I think it was, and she, she or he asked that for my first trip, should I go to Kyoto, Osaka and Tokyo? And you know, there's various answers, but my suggestion is yes, it's good to do the Silk Road. You know, those are the main Tokyo, Kyoto, Osaka. It's good to do it on the first trip just to, to say you've done it. And then after that, you can decide if you want to come back and spend more time in different places or you want to go outside of that. You don't have to do that first, but I would suggest it. And another question that came up was, should I do a tour? Again, there's, there's several different um, answers to this, but I would say if you can, if you have the time and you can afford it, I think a tour is a good way to go on your first trip. So you get all the history and you get all the explanation because if not you're just going place to place and yes you can look at the brochures but they're not really that good and you can watch YouTube videos and try and help each other with what's going on but the problem still is that you need more context right so I it's not a bad idea to go on a tour at the for, for your first time and then after that you can go on your own but you don't have to you can you know do your own research and move along as it comes well again that's up to you um, but yes it's probably a good idea to do the main three that route the Silk Road route from Tokyo, uh, Kyoto, and Osaka. Now, again, a lot of people talk about the busiest time of the year to come and um, or not to come. And, you know, that's usually the three big holidays. Golden Week, which just was this past uh, last month. Um, Obon, the middle of August. And Oshogatsu, that's New Year's. So those are the three that you probably don't want to come. But again, you could come. It's just very, very crowded. And you know that in April, everybody wants to come for cherry blossom season. I think they had um, 3 million people come th th this year just for the cherry blossom season. So there's a lot of things going on. One thing that came up recently was the overcrowding issue and um, it is overcrowded especially in Kyoto especially during peak you know cherry blossom season you just have to move differently right so like I said last time if possible you can go out earlier in the morning if you're not on a tour you know go and see the temples and they're not always open until maybe 8 but you can go out and you know see a lots of things before you know people start to come through another thing is that you could time it where you don't have have to come during that time you know you maybe you want to see cherry blossom season like now a lot of people talk about right now it's rainy season it hasn't started yet but for example if you're coming in rain june you may want to go to hokkaido because hokkaido doesn't have a rainy season so it's not like you have to you know that you got you have to avoid rainy season but if you come to honshu the only place i would not i suggested last time too is not to come to during rainy season is okinawa because okinawa is right where the cusp of the high and the low system meet and that's just exactly where the rainy season is and they get hit really really hard they're getting hit right now in fact uh today they're getting from today on it's rainy season especially in okinawa rainy season has not arrived here in um kyoto yet and then in honshu and other parts of japan outside of okinawa they have sometimes what is called karatsuyu karatsuyu means it's it's a dry rainy season which means it doesn't rain that much and it's there's not that much difference i've been here what over 30 about 30 years in japan i haven't seen a real like heavy heavy rainy season that often so again that might be a time to come it's a little humid however there's not that many people here because they're not you know they, they, they came in april may okay i have a question from bridget yeah how's the economy in japan now sounds like you guys are suffering here it is uh it sounds like you're suffering just like you're in the united States. Actually, Japan is really struggling right now and mainly because of the yen, the dollar yen rate. But that's the reason that I'm making this live too is I'm saying if, if you're gonna come, now's the time to come this year because it was what? It's it's bo it's moving between 155 and 160 right now. That's like the best deal in town, right? Think about it. It was normally between about 115 to maybe 125 back a few months ago. Actually back even farther than that. And now it's at close to 160. So basically it's almost like everything is like 30% off. Imagine if you're going anywhere to any store or to any restaurant and you would get 30% off. Of course you would go there, right? Well, Japan is basically everything is on sale for people who have dollars. 
if you're making yen like me or the Japanese, then you're SOL because now everything is 30% more expensive. And that's why places like Hawaii or even like in the New York where a lot of Japanese tourists used to go during Golden Week and things, they weren't going. A few went because imagine now you're taking a family of five or four, you know, and I heard the story on television where they said that, oh yeah, um, a family of five, you know, it was like, I don't know, $40 for McDonald's or something. I mean, it was something astronomical. So again, if you're making yen, you're not in a good situation. But what I do want to talk about also is that you never really know how the, the yen dollar will fluctuate because back in, I think it was 2010, 2011, when I first came back for the, this last time, 2005, it was 125, okay, 125 to the dollar. And that was hard. You know, I was getting paid in yen and I and I was having, I was struggling. And then in the year 2011, 2012, it went, it went down to 80 yen per dollar. And that's when you all the Japanese were traveling out, right? That's when Japan would look really expensive. And I think that's where it gets its idea that, oh, Japan is so expensive was because of those years. But now you got the complete opposite. You got almost like a, what, uh, 50, 60, 70 yen difference from that, from the lowest period till now. So Japan really is a bargain. So think about it. You can come to a place that you're getting everything off 30%. And as I said in my first um, video, and if, if you haven't seen it, it's on my YouTube page channel. You can see it there. It's like the best deal in town right now. So you can get the best deal in town as well as it's safe. It's a safe country. It's as I said last time too, it's probably one of the safest countries in the world, especially with 127 million people. It's, it's you know, per capita crime is very, very low. Yes, you have murders. Yes, you have robberies. Yes, you have crime, but it's one of the safest, if not the safest in the world. Okay, thank you for that question, Bridget. Um, Eva asks, is it just as easy to navigate the train system in Osaka and Kyoto as it is in Tokyo? I think that Kyoto, Osaka is actually easier because it's smaller. Um, yes, there are maybe, you know, there are different lines and things. So, you know, there's Kintetsu and then there's JR and then there's um, Hankyu. But Tokyo has private lines coming out of their main hub also. So yeah, I think Osaka, Kyoto is quite easy to um, manage, right? And as long as you have, you know, either the Suica card or the Koka card or the Pasmo card, that's all you need. Just keep it refilled and you can just go through for, for almost every bus and train and even some, most taxis. Some taxis don't have the machine yet, but a lot of them have the taxis. So yes, not a problem at all. Remember, the only thing about traveling on the trains is try to avoid rush hour. And that's usually 7, 7.30 to maybe 9. And then in the, in, the, in the later evening, it's usually maybe, I would say 5 to maybe 7.30. But the main rush is morning. That's the bad one. In the evening, it's not that bad. The last train going back to certain areas, the last train, usually 11 something close to 12 midnight, that one is super, super crowded. So you want to avoid the last train. So you want to avoid rush hour and you want to avoid the last train. And I think that you, you should be fine. Unless you want the experience, I always suggest to people, if you want to see what the average salary man or salary woman goes through, ride the train in the morning during rush hour at least once just to see what they go through. And then you would have a lot more empathy for their, their lifestyle. You know, you feel, I feel sorry a lot of times. You know, in America, a lot of times you just get in your car and drive to your place. But in Japan, almost everybody has to use the train. And so everybody, imagine the morning, a lot of them travel an hour to an hour and a half because they live outside of Tokyo or Osaka in the suburbs because they wanted to have their own home. So that's where they have to live. And so they commute, what, three hours a day, some of them. And after working eight to what, 10 hours a day, it's not an easy life for a lot of the Japanese. Star asks, is it better to do the US exchange before leaving our home country or in Japan? Okay, thank you, Star. This is a kind of a tough question because it depends on where you're getting your exchange in the United States. For example, in Hawaii, my sister works for a bank and you know, so she, she was able to get a good rate um, and you know, if you have connections, et cetera, et cetera. So she was getting a pretty good rate, then exchange it there. But if you're just going to like, let's say I was living in Alaska and you're going to go into Wells Fargo in Fairbanks, Alaska, and you're going to exchange it there where they don't even really have, they don't even maybe don't even want the yen, but let's say they were able to do it. It would not be a good rate. So it really, really depends on your state, your city, your bank, and how much access. The more access they have, for example, Hawaii has a lot of access 
to Japanese tourists, right? Because normally, outside of now, they usually come, which means that they have a lot of yen. So that yen, they want to re recycle back out to people who want, they want to sell it, right? Because they can make, of course, a little profit. So that's what happens is that a place that has a lot of Japanese, maybe New York City, maybe Los Angeles, maybe Honolulu, a lot of those banks will probably give you a pretty good rate. But outside of that, it really depends and it depends on where you live. So the other thing is, as soon as you arrive, if you have time, you can change. When you come out of, of customs, there are two banks, I think, there on, on, on each side that you can change money there. The other thing is you have to have your passport when you show. Um, when you change money in Japan, it's it's a lot more complicated, meaning that there's a lot more paperwork to do. You know, you got to sign two or three things. And, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not like you go to Thailand and you just go to the money exchanger and boom, 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 it's done. In Japan, there's a process. And if you can't do it at the airport, you can do it at banks. Like, for example, I use UFJ, but UFJ, has a certain section in Kyoto that's open every day except Wednesday I think it was anyway they're closed one or two days a week so you got you have to check I forgot it was nine to five or something so there's set hours and the other thing is for those of you who have an ATM card that allows you to withdraw like I use um, a Citibank card when I travel outside I can put that, that that card into any country I'm at in and they will give me whatever I want in that currency so if you have that type that works too you know the exchange rate is not as good as maybe directly but then you don't have to carry the cash let's see any other questions Ibrahim has talked about going to outside areas I would highly suggest as you get more confident that you go out to more rural areas because to me that's where the old so-called old Japan or the old Japan heart still lives Tohoku, Hokuriku, um, Shikoku, Kyushu, even somewhere in Hokkaido. Those are the memories I think that a lot of you will have. Now, a lot of people worry about like, why well, I don't speak Japanese. Okay, that could be a problem. And again, the train systems, once you leave the big cities, not all of them have English. You know, they're written in kanji or sometimes they have hiragana. And if you can't read that, of course, you can ask someone. What's amazing now is with Google Translate, you can take the picture and it will give you the Japanese or at least tell you how it's, how it's pronounced right which is really really important you know back when I first came didn't have that it was just hand-to-hand -hand combat you have to just figure it out on your own but you have this and again because it's safe in Japan even if you make a mistake and you can ask people you know like for help or you can just show them you know oh I'm going here koko ni ikimasu kara or I'm going here um, is it here you know gestures work big big gestures and just a smile gestures and and asking and you can also use the google translate you could write it out in english and you can show them that could work too so whichever way works for you again getting back to bridget's uh question is that yes japan is struggling now so for those of you who live in hawaii and maybe los angeles and new york it's not you're not going to get many japanese tourists for a long while except for the otani fans they will continue to go probably wherever he is probably los angeles because he has such a huge following that the otani fans will follow matter what the price is but uh, what the yen rate is but otherwise you know think about it for a lot a lot of people to Hawaii were families and they were repeaters right I think it was over 50% almost that were repeaters to Hawaii they're gonna have a hard time going now with the yen rate so right now is the time for all of you who have dollars or you know or or your exchange currency is good against uh, the yen now's the time to come to Japan and the reason I keep talk saying that is this is the time is because next year 2025 April is Expo Osaka Expo which has not gotten a lot of publicity yet but that's gonna be huge and they're expecting millions to come although they haven't really advertised it that well so far but that means that everything else is gonna be full hotels it's gonna be crowded that's I think six months April to July if I recall correctly anyway it's six months and you don't want to come during that time unless you want to see the expo or you are doing business in the expo then yeah by all means of course come but if you want to avoid tourists and higher costs and full hotels then it's probably a good idea to avoid next year 2025 for those six months which means that this is the year to come right if you can come the fall would be great the only thing that I would say and some people may disagree is I would not come here in July August and to the end of September because of the humidity the humidity is so hot it's not the heat it's the humidity and it's just very very uncomfortable now if you're staying in hotels you're fortunate because you know once you're in the hotel it's not a problem only when you 
you go outside. But you know, for the daily people like myself, we have a little air condition, you know, you, you try to keep it running when you can. One, it's expensive, so you try to just limit that. Two, it's that it doesn't keep get the room really cool. It's not like central heating type of air conditioning, so it's different. But if you're in the hotel, you're fine once you're in the hotel or if you're, or if you're moving underground. Or go to Hokkaido in the summer because Hokkaido can get warm up to 30, 35 degrees centigrade sometimes, but it doesn't have the humidity. So rainy season or maybe in the hot summer, July, August, September, if you wanna come to Japan and you don't mind going to Hokkaido, Go to Hokkaido. Thank you, Star. About what is Expo? Expo is an exposition. It's where different countries put on their their best face. It's their PR moment, you know. And a lot of smaller business join each country's booth, and they have like tables and things set up. They're the last one, I think it was in was it in the I think UAE or Dubai. I'm not sure, but there was Expo there this year. It's in Osaka. The last one here in Osaka was. I was sixth grade, so that's many, many, many years ago. But they still have the big bampaku or the expo, the, the symbol in Osaka. If you come to Osaka, you'll see that. That's from the, the last exposition. So they haven't done an expo until now, which is great that they're doing it. However, they are worried that cost of inflation, cost of materials, they might not be able to finish it. And you know, of course, there's always a panic at the end. And again, if you wanna come to see the expo, then that's the time to come. But if you wanna avoid the crowds and the cost, and you know, then maybe well you could go to Tokyo you don't have if you come during that time if you're not going to Osaka you could go to Tokyo it's probably be fine it's just the Kansai area would be quite crowded because you have a lot of visitors and people traveling but I'm sure you're gonna have people from the expo who want to also see Tokyo so just expect that there's gonna be quite a few people there thank you Sammy 1970 was the last um, expo here and it was huge and it was very very successful and it, you know they have the big park now expo park and the cherry trees are still there and everything so they planned it and it's this it still remains in 1970 okay I'm gonna just talk about a couple other things then a couple of good things is you know you talk about over tourism and people in especially in Kyoto are worried and you should read a lot of those stories about now you can't take a picture with the uh, Michael Sung and things which you know it's just common courtesy right the other thing was just yesterday last night on NHK I just saw they just started a new bus Tokyo special bus on Saturday Sundays and I think holidays this is like the tourist bus and what and, and what this does is that it will hit the main spots I think Kiyomizu and I think it goes through Gion one of them but anyway so that will take some of the pressure off of the public buses in Kyoto so Kyoto is trying to to take and handle over too many tourists the problem is everything is slow in Japan and even slower in Kyoto they always go back to oh it's traditional traditional but traditional sometimes equals slow conservative sometimes too slow so things happen very slowly but they are working on it at least they're moving in the in the right direction and you know on a couple of other YouTube videos I've seen is that people are worried that oh there's a different price for foreigners now I have never seen this so far I think it's just a few places but it wasn't like they were like okay foreign price and Japanese price I think it was more like they were making certain things like seafood donburi seafood bowls that they knew that foreigners would like and then they were marking it up high because foreigners wanted to eat this so again I don't think I again I have never seen this but I don't think it's like they're making a special price for you and you it's basically they create a dish which is in the image of maybe what foreigners really want to eat full with all you know ikura and, and uni and all these things and they sell it and they mark it up so there is a choice you don't have to eat that you could eat what the regular Japanese people are eating and you probably be the same price I'm guessing again I wouldn't worry so much about that different price but if there is a difference in a price I mean you have to look at it too like a lot of countries like Myanmar India Thailand they have uh for like certain sites you know like the the resident or the citizen um, of the country price and they have a tourist price and it's just part of the system so if Japan eventually went that way not that I'm saying it's great but I, I said it's not nothing that unusual I mean think about it in like in Hawaii we have the Kamaaina rate right if you go to Diamond Head I think Diamond Head for if you're a resident 
if you're a kamaaina, it's free. But if you're a tourist, it's five dollars. Not much, but five dollars, right? So s same idea. So again, everybody makes a lot of big, you know, big noise about it, you know, for these YouTube videos. But I think not such a big deal. And if it does happen, it's gonna be limited, I believe. You know, they're not out there to rake you over the coast. They're just trying to manage some crowd control, right? Yeah, and yes, you're gonna have some places that maybe are not the best, you know, businesses. Maybe they try to not cheat, but try to take advantage. But again, very unlikely in Japan. Okay, the best thing would be is to try and go to outside areas of Japan. And as I said before, even if you don't have Japanese, if you can get the train tickets, you can get there to the hotel and figure out. It's not easy, but it's not that hard. And honestly, if you're able to do that, there's a sense of achievement and you go like, wow, I did it without Japanese. That's And there is a different sense of feeling when you come back, when you go home. You're gonna, you, you'll feel a sense of confidence. Sometimes you have to go through a little bit of suffrage to, to understand and appreciate when you are successful. And you will be successful because even if you get lost, you can always figure out how to get back home, right? And Japanese people are really, really kind. It's just that they're very shy and more standoffish, especially in the country areas. So you have to be the one to approach. Not too many people are gonna come up to you and say, oh, you know, do you need some help? Maybe in Tokyo, maybe sometimes in Kyoto, maybe you have some people come up to you and say, can I help you or do you need help? But outside, most times that will not happen. It will be up to you. But all you have to do is smile and ask nicely. Sumimasen, you know, like, you know, again, know the, the 10 basic words like, I'm sorry, excuse me. And then you can try and say it in English or you can show them on your phone or you can show them on your paper where you're trying to go. People are willing to help and they're very helpful, but they will not come up to you normally, you know, because I think part of the experience, the main part of the traveling experience, it's not really seeing so many temples or seeing Mount Fuji. I think it's really about the people you meet on the trip. Those are the people who make the memory. So you wanna try and increase that part. And if you don't speak Japanese, then as I said in the last live, you have to figure out ways that allow you to have more access to people, either they speak English or you're able to, you know, um, find like volunteer students or volunteer people who are willing to work with you or something. But a lot of Japanese, a lot of Japanese, they want to speak English or want to try. Most of them, even if they've studied six years, sometimes they go to the university, eight years, you know, six to eight to 10 years they've studied. They have never spoken one word of English outside of that class. So they have never actually used it because it's basically an academic subject in Japan. It's like mathematics or science. It's not a communicative skill language, like probably in Europe, it's used more like that or taught like that. So you could actually make it a win-win situation where everyone's really happy if you are able to open up to them, give them, let them feel comfortable to talk to you. I think you would have a really, really good time. Eva here writes, I love the holiday illumination Japan, but don't want to travel in December. In the middle of November, it's too early to see. Oh, I will try and find that out for you, Eva. You can write me, you know, you can write me in the comments again that I think it's usually from the beginning beginning of December that, that, that they start. But again, December is cold, but not that cold usually. <laughs> so you may want to come during that time. Normally, like the weather is pretty clear and nice. It's just a little cold. And if you're staying in hotels, you're fine because you have central heating. It's people like me who have these little like you know, all season heater coolers that they don't really keep get everything really warm. And every and in Japan, they try to save electricity. So you don't have the whole house, all the heaters going. You only have one room, you close all the doors and you eat and you watch TV and, and there. And some people even sleep if they only have a small house. And then from there, you go to your bedroom and then you turn off that heater and you go to your bed and either you turn it on for 30 minutes and then turn it off because you're not supposed to leave it on all night or you just jump into your futong. That's why they have like, oh, furo, right? I think oh, furo's one of the functions is heat your body so you, you can jump into the futong and then you can be warm during the winter months. That's my story, but I think that's part of it. But you, if you're in the hotel, Eva, 
no problem. You got central heating. All you're worried about is walking around. You got your jacket on, your down jacket on. I will say though, light ups are beautiful and amazing in Japan, but they're very, very crowded. And I guess you can expect that in any place in Japan. But yeah, they're beautiful. The other interesting part is most of them end, what was, some of them end right before Christmas and some of them end on Christmas. So you would think like, oh, okay, holidays for the Japanese is after Christmas because Christmas is not a holiday in Japan, right? Most Japanese are off like the 27th, 28th of December until maybe January 3rd. So you would think, oh, you would have it for the people. But no, it's almost like, again, everything has like a rule. Oh, okay, it's December 25th or whatever. Stop, turn off, break down the uh, illumination. When you think they could make so much money, right? I'm attracting people to come and buy things at the shops and whatever. Nope, the rule is the rule. I don't know if they're gonna change that in the future, but again, it's if you're staying in a hotel, yeah, you, Eva, I guess you're from Hawaii, right? So it means that, you know, maybe it's a little cold, but it's, it's not cold, cold, like more like end of January you know so again it's up to you everybody's level of coldness is a little bit different Abraham says his favorite store is Ibaraki no one speaks English never had any issues been going for many years there Abraham is an example basically you can do anything like my sister I don't know if she's on this live or not you know she can do it you know she went to Japanese school for nine years I mean she doesn't speak Japanese but she can read a few things but she doesn't want to go alone because she's so afraid that I don't know she has this fear and she always tells me oh no I can if I want but she won't but anyway my point is that anybody can do it and I believe and this is why I'm trying to get my sister to go solo you know I've taken her what one two three times already in the last ten not eight years and again there'll be this fall again but I tell her if you do it on your own and you accomplish it there's a sense of fulfillment and and happiness that you cannot get when you're with a tour or you're with somebody that's translating for you. Yes, you can get more of a deeper story. Yes, you can get more context, but you cannot get that feeling of like, I did it, wow, they understood what I said. I said, toilet wa doko desu ka? And they took me to the toilet. You know, I'm, I'm, of course, I'm just exaggerating a bit, but something like that. Definitely, like when I travel to like um, Thailand even, and I, I'm outside of Bangkok, they, they don't speak English maybe. It's tough. And it work, it helps you with your communicative skills and your ability to communicate. And when you're successful, you feel so good. It's a great feeling. And Japan is the perfect place to do that because it's safe. People are nice. You don't have to worry about getting mugged or shot or kidnapped usually. I mean like 99.9% .9 of the time. So definitely if you want to experiment in traveling on your own or traveling without knowing the language, this is the perfect experimental place. And then maybe after this, you want to go to Thailand or you want to go to Indonesia or somewhere else that you know it's a little bit more challenging but this is a great stepping stone so M Matt Hatta says it's better to go to a mom and dad eateries as they are so much better and fancy and I and I go to the Hokkaido area and just different towns yes 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 Matt Hatta you get it that's what you want to do you want to go to like the small hole in the wall places right that's why I say I'm not a foodie but even if I say oh so and so is the best uh, Matsunoya is the best tonkatsuya or something to eat you know it's cheap it's fast you know, you know and, and you go there it's like Again, 99.9% .9 place is going to be fine or at least decent. Maybe not big volumes of food at different places, but it's going to be decent, right? And so why not go out and explore? Because you can't, it's not like you're worried about food poisoning or anything, right? You, you just go out and you can experiment. And having mom and dad's, um, you know, I mean like the mom and dad shop, those are the places you remember. And those are the places maybe you make a connection, you try to talk a little bit. And they, you make them happy because they talk to you and you're happy because they communicated. Those smaller places, they're not that busy. So they, they offer you time that you, you, you have time to, to try and communicate. That's another thing. You want to go to a place that is, is not so busy that people don't have time for you. You, know, you never know who might be a person that you can talk to or make smile or communicate with, I think, right? And yeah, Hokkaido, of course. Hokkaido is basically outside of support of smaller towns. Wonderful. Love Hokkaido. Mad Hatta. Thank you very much. Yeah, Abraham says, Japan is awesome for anyone, anytime. Matt Hatta says, um, okay, this is interesting here. Let's see. Um, Sapporo has the best Christmas decorations. It's amazing. It's cold, but not that cold. And there is the underground pole, pole tower, which is so amazing. So many shops and easy to walk to Sapporo station. Yes. I, I, did I make a video on that? I might have made a shirts video on that, but 
For those of you who are interested in Japan or in some of the videos I made, please subscribe if you haven't. And、um, you can see on my YouTube channel, Man in Japan page, there's several. Please、um, subscribe and watch if, if you're interested. But anyway, getting back to what I was going to say is that Sapporo is brilliant, okay? Because they have an underground complex that runs the entire main street, Odori, underneath. And so I used to think, like, when I went to the Yuki Matsuri, the, the, the snow fest, Or you watch those YouTube videos, everybody's outside and they go, Oh, it's cold, it's cold, oh, it's so cold, it's so cold, right? Yeah, it's cold outside, you know, usually in a second weekend of February, right? When I went two years ago and they canceled it because of COVID, I was watching. I didn't see many people walking around. And then I found out, oh, yeah, as Mad Hatta is saying, underground. So I went underground and it was like a whole nother city underground. And so that's how the Sapporo residents get around. They're not walking in the snow. Oh, they're walking underground. And then there's exits that come out all the way through. So if you gotta go to UFJ, here it is. You gotta go to the blood bank, it's here. You gotta go here, you gotta go. So you can stay warm for most of the time. You're just coming out to the surface when you're gonna look for the building, but you're taking the exit that's close to your building. So it's not that cold. So again, Um, Sapporo, as Manhattan said, good place to go. You got the underground network. That's amazing. Of, it's like a labyrinth of, of, of shops and restaurants and everything. You know, it's just amazing. And even summer, most people want to be outside and walk on the street. And it's fine. But if it gets too warm, sometimes it gets between 30 and 35 degrees centigrade, which is quite warm. But again, Hokkaido doesn't have the humidity most of the time. It's more like Hawaii. The, 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 the most humid it gets is like Hawaii sometimes gets in the summer a little humid. A little bit, and what happens is because it's so warm, because of global warming and, and weather change, what's happening in Hokkaido is okay, if you're in a hotel, a good hotel, you'll be fine, you have air conditioning. But if you're at an old hotel, or you're at someone's home, or you are at like certain residences or sites, they don't have air conditioning because they never needed it before. It's just like Alaska. Alaska used to never need air conditioning. It never got above 65 degrees、uh, Fahrenheit, right? But now it's getting warmer and warmer. Well, that's how Hokkaido is. So I was staying in a hotel when I was doing some training for two weeks last year, and it hit 28, 29 degrees, which is about what, 80? And there was no air conditioning. They only have like a fan. And it was actually super warm at night. I opened the window and I, did, and I went down to the front desk and I complained a little bit. I said, Don't you have, they don't have air conditioning. Of course, it was a cheap business hotel. So, you know, so again, if you go to Hokkaido, stay in a nice hotel, you'll have air conditioning.、You、stay in a not so high level hotel, you may not. And again, just to be aware of that. Oh, yeah. Okay, Abraham, thank you. I did make one about Sapporo. Yeah. Manhattan, that's the person. Write her on the comments if you have any questions about the, the Yuki Matsuri, because it's really something to see. I've been there three times. I enjoy it. It's fun.、Uh, just that there's a lot of people. Something you want to see in your life. I mean, I know China has one in Harbin that's even much, much, much. Bigger and huge, and super, super cold, they say. But、uh, I've never been there. I've been to Hokkaido s、uh, three times. And then there's also around outside of Sapporo, like I, I was on a tour with my mom and dad on this, this second Yuki Matsuri trip. And they took you to like different places like Solo and different places around Hokkaido that had their own mini Yuki Matsuri festival in time with the big one. So people could do both. So we did that. There's also some in Tohoku, the northern part of Honshu, that you could, they have it in, in sync with that, the big one in Sapporo. And you could come down and see other things. So, you might want to do more than just the Sapporo one. You might want to do other places. And, you know, so you need a week, two weeks maybe to do all of this. So, what do you folks think? Does this live help in any way? Do you think that this is something to keep doing? Or this is just, okay, that's like a video. You do it once and that's it. I, I was thinking that I'm trying to build kind of a community of people who are interested in Japan, who would like to share what they know, as well as ask some questions. I don't know all the answers. But I give them my point of view. Again, I don't know everything. I've only been here 30 years, but still, that's you know, not enough. And,、um, and I'm not always doing it from the、um, tourist point of view. I'm kind of doing it sometimes as a foreign resident living here. So, again, I, I, I'm always very curious to see what you folks are interested in and what you're curious about. And another reason is if there's enough interest, I will make a video about certain topics. But again, if you go on YouTube right now, There are so many 
about so many, you know, like in different areas that I figured, oh, let the young people do it, right? But if there are certain subjects that you uh, in the community were interested in, I thought, okay, it's worth doing a video. I'd go out and try and do a video. So again, if you have any questions or you have any suggestions, please write in the comments, you know, what you think. A couple of things, you already know, most of you know this, you've been to Japan, right? Um, you're gonna walk a lot, right? So of course you wanna have walking shoes. I would say train before you come. Train meaning at least walk one or two months before you come because a lot of walking, a lot of steps, stairs. And I think that's one of the reasons Japanese, recently you see more obese Japanese, but still very, very few compared to like the United States. I think the United States is somewhere around 60% are overweight or obese. And um, in Japan, it's still uncommon, but it's different now. But again, I think there's two things going on. People always say it's the food. Yeah, true. But there's a lot of um, deep fried foods too in Japan, right? Like bento, that's a lot of all fried foods. But I think it's the walking because they have to walk because they use the public transportation, right? Think about it. From my house, apartment to the station if i were to walk it's one kilometer it would take me 20 minutes or i ride the bike 15 minutes 10 to 15 minutes right i take the train and i get to my place fortunately my office is right next to the train station which is unusual most japanese have to walk another 10 or 15 minutes to their office or company so if you just add up the time 15 let's say 15 50 they walk one hour just to get and to work and back work so i think it's the walking and there's a lot of steps and things you know that actually keeps helps them keep their weight down so it's it's actually very healthy just that um i would train or at least do some walking before you come because you'll be amazed at how many steps and you go it's it can be quite exhausting for some people there's one thing i do want to talk about a little bit you see some videos about manners on the train and and there is a lot to do with this too um and it's not that foreigners intend to be rude or offensive in any way usually not it's just that it's a difference of thinking and culture and things right for example like the phone right um using the phone on the on no one is talking you know on the on the train you can text but you can't talk and it's, you know and if you took a like let's say you took the uh, sky train in in bangkok everybody's like talking and you know it's it's like really noisy and things right so japan i think that's a great rule to have you know like it keeps everybody more or less more quiet the other thing is that you see a lot of youtube videos talk about not eating or drinking on the train and it's very confusing because i myself made several mistakes because I thought when I first came to Japan 30 years ago, 40 years ago, it's that you could eat on the Shinkansen, you know, you could eat on those long distance trains, figure like one train, same, right? Train, train. So I remember one day I bought bento and I'm eating on the commuter train and everybody was looking at me. Now remember, I have a Japanese face too, which makes it even worse because they're more upset because I'm, you know, he's, what is this Japanese guy doing, right? Kind of thing. Of course, they're thinking that, right? Never had the idea, but people were staring at me until finally after this that I asked my friend I said how come people were staring at me I was just eating my lunch you know and he said what train were you on I said oh the one from Hankyu to uh, Umeda and he laughed and he said Mike you don't eat on the train and I, but I said yeah you eat on the train like to go to like you know Toyama or to Tokyo on the Shinkansen and he laughed again and he said there's a difference long distance trains and commuter trains are different so you don't eat on commuter trains but you can't eat on long distance trains and what is a long distance train well a lot of times you might have a little table or a more comfortable kind of a seat you know like two 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 but again there's some commuter trains that have this too so when in rome do like the romans japanese have the same proverb you know just watch if people are eating maybe that's great now as far as drinking i do sometimes too like i'll take my water out and i'll quickly drink you know take a sip or something so i don't think that's that big a deal but like eating like a meal or a hamburger or a mcdonald's on the train a commuter train sorry please avoid from doing that another thing is loud talking a lot of westerners especially americans speak really loud you know having a good time they're joking they're laughing this and this on the train that's kind of frowned upon so it's okay to talk but just keep it down to a minimum if possible and I, and one more thing that i just saw about a month ago was i was on the train going out to nada and i saw this i think they were speaking french i'm not sure but there and it was a, it was like a group of family of three teenage girls and they were kind of sprawled out on the commuter train you know like sitting sideways and taking um taking like for two people taking like three or four people's spot that's probably not a good idea <laughs> so i would suggest same just follow what everybody's doing and do it and you, you find and then there's other times that i see foreigners who are 
overly considerate. They're great. Like I just saw it last week. I'm, you know, I was sitting in one of the chairs and next was the handicap, the, you know, the handicap for older people, pregnant women, disabled. And they, and nobody was around. So no one's there you can sit. So they came in at the end before the doors closed and they sat. On the first stop, this older lady, wasn't she wasn't super old. She was just a little bit older. She got on. They immediately got up and gave her the seat. They knew. The other Japanese weren't moving, but she, but they were. So you have, you know, foreigners who really are considerate and others who don't realize about that. One more thing about the, this Google Maps. Some people on YouTube say, wow, Google Maps is so great. My opinion, my honest opinion is that Google Maps is not that good. It's 90% maybe accurate, but when you're trying, you know, sometimes it gives you the underground on the, the street level directions and you're underground or vice versa, and it can be confusing. You know, there's Google Maps, Apple Maps and the Japanese like Navi, Navi Time, right? They call it. Um, and Navi Time, according to my friend Yoshi, who's the number one travel person in, in Japan, he said that's the best. The problem for me with Navi Time is two things. One is it's a Japanese app. So you have to think like a Japanese and how it, the process moves. So for me, it's a little bit confusing. So I I, I stay with Google Maps or, or Apple Maps, but he swears by it. So if you have more of a left brain way of thinking and you're good at maps, maybe Navi Time is the best. According to Yoshi, it's the best to use. And the only thing is though, it used to be completely free. And um, recently there's a certain level that you go that you, you, you have to pay for the premium or whatever. So now you, they charge after a certain amount. I don't know what the, the, the marker is. In, near Sapporo, there's a statue of Buddha, which in the winter you can see is over covered in Buddha. Oh, okay. No, I haven't, no, I don't know that Matt Hatta. Matt Hatta wrote about seeing um, this. I, I don't know about this. Lavender is one of my most favorite memories. It's in July in Furano and Bie in Hokkaido, and it's beautiful. And the smell is wonderful. If you get a chance to go to Hokkaido in July, definitely don't miss the lavender. Um, Star says, let's see. Uh, is that train eating is that train eating changing with the younger generation yeah it is changing a little bit you will see um especially like the kids the high school and the junior high school kids who get on the train and they're starving they just came from their practice they went to school all day and then they went to the convenience store they grab bread or whatever yes you might see them eating on the train so thank you star that's exactly right you, you know they're starving so they're just shoving the, the you know usually it's bread or pan or like you know some kind of sandwich because they don't have time they just got, came from the club practice you know in japan they they usually go to school like until about three i think it was and then if you join a club junior high school or high school and they practice every day basically even sometimes on saturdays and they they're intense so they'll go maybe two hours three hours sometimes a day and so they're starving but they got so to, to take the train home they'll grab some in the convenience store jump on the train and yes you might see some of them eating on the train as well as you will see some university students who maybe they're they're, they're trying to show their um independence that they're an adult that they are college students that will do it with you know just to kind of show off sometimes i don't know that's that's my thinking but again definitely not a norm but yes do you see much of the younger people who are um doing the eating on the train and some of them are laughing noisily too like i just said don't talk loud or don't laugh too loud you, you might see some of that too if you have a backpack on the train where the back oh yeah, yeah and don't put your fingers between the door if you're running together <laughs> okay <laughs> thank you Matt Hatta. um yes the japanese do this I, I I haven't done it much, but I try to be careful. But once you got your backpack, they put it in the front because when you turn, even when you take the airlines, right? I've been hit by people when you when you get onto the airplane that you know they got a big giant backpack, you know, from in America, and then they turn and then they hit you. They don't even know they hit you, and you know you can't say really much. And oh, uh, well, that's why, of course, Japanese thinking ten steps ahead about worrying about consideration for others, right? That they they, they have a sign and they even the announcement to put the backpack reversed onto the front that way you have control over it and you're not banging people and you can control so yes that's something very japanese you know that's the beauty of japan right that consideration for others not to the word is meiwaku meiwaku means to bother or to you know um to trouble others this is the most non-meiwaku country in the world but <laughs> 
there are certain things that are so meiwaku. This is the most non-meiwaku but can be meiwaku country in the world. For example, this is my favorite example. They have what is called the senden ka. Senden means advertisement, so advertisement car. And those are the cars with the big speakers on the top. It's usually campaign or election that, that, that you know, they're doing. And they'll have it on the top and they'll have the microphone going. And they are really, really loud and obnoxious. You know, they're saying. And normally because they campaign differently, all they're doing is saying the name. Like it was Okajima. Okajima yes, Okajima, Okajima. Because they're trying to plant the name into people mind because they're just driving past right it is the most meiwaku thing i ever heard you know and then right by my apartment here sunday morning 7 45 a.m you got the send in car coming by with the big and I, I i keep saying if i was if i could vote i would never vote for whoever does that right but when i ask the japanese doesn't that bother you they all go kind of like oh shikata ganai cannot be helped that's the, you know that's like i said yeah but you know they wake you up in the morning it's so noisy you know or if at the station sometimes Sometimes you see them at the corner when it's really busy rush hour and they're, and they're standing on their little truck or car and they're doing their speech with a super loud loudspeakers and nobody's listening and just noisy. That's the, um, for me, the most biggest meiwaku. But again, other times like this, you know, about the talking on the train, about the uh, turning your phone, not talking, on, not talking on your phone in the train, all of those things are to not bother other people, right? So Japan really is, can be a land of paradoxes you have complete opposites right you know and i think that's the beauty in some ways of japan and that's also for me many times the the confusing part of japan the meiwaku but so meiwaku you know the the, the no bother don't bother anybody but again big big bother but nobody seems to worry about it <laughs> anyway i think that's what i call one of the paradoxes thank you manhata and abraham for so many and star for so many um questions or comments the train is full and you're standing in the door and the train stops outside let people out oh yeah 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 yeah. this is a good one too um, a lot of times foreigners don't know everybody lines up which is great because you know there's places that i've been that in other countries that it's a, it's a free for all very orderly very japanese this is the beauty of japan and then people stand on the side so if the door is going to open this way Way, they're gonna stand you're gonna wait here the door opens you let the people out first and then you get in and as Manhattan wrote in the previous comment is and the doors are closing don't stick your hands in because it's gonna close and it's it's a pretty strong close it's not like an elevator door that you can kind of stick your hand in and stop it it's not gonna happen do not stick your fingers in, in to try and stop a door if you're trying to get in again if you can't get your body in don't put your hand in you know or don't stick an umbrella there you know <laughs> I've seen some people do some crazy things just take the next train please write in the comments if you have any more questions or if you feel like this is you know even something that you get something out of if you're not getting anything or you already know everything then maybe this is not for you or uh, you know maybe this is not worth doing but I, I hope to do more of these just because it gives people a chance to you know share this one too I see in some of the videos too can you can you talk about the taking your own trash garbage home if hiking in the, okay what you see in a lot of YouTube videos and it is true Japan is one of the cleanest places in the world. However, you don't see garbage cans around. And you wonder, where are the garbage cans? Well, there are garbage cans strategically placed, but also a lot of people take their own garbage home. So it's good to carry one of those small plastic bags with you, empty one. In Japan, they don't have a plastic um, issue like in Hawaii, it's banned, right? So you can take around your plastic, little plastic bags. And people put their garbage in there, put it in their backpack and take it home and throw it away. That's what's kind of expected. Now, where to find, don't tell anybody, <laughs> where to find garbage cans. Well, one is the convenience store, of course. So of course they'd like you to buy something and then put it in. But if you're walking past, sometimes I've gone in quickly and just put my iced coffee cup, throw it in the garbage can or whatever into their garbage can. But of course, if you can, what they offer these convenience stores is toilet usually, almost all, 99.9%. .9%. Only once in a while you have one that doesn't have and garbage cans. So that's where the convenience store is really convenient, especially toilets. That is my number one really happy thing that the convenience stores offer. Almost all of them have toilets. In fact, they, that's one of their, their advertisements, like on the big signs when you're driving, they have a toilet here. They're trying to get you to stop. And so maybe hopefully you'll buy something. So that's actually part of their, their sales process. But it's great to have a toilet, right? Because, you know, I've been to a couple of countries, like once I was in, I think it was France, and I couldn't find a toilet, only the pay toilet right and so I, I asked the guide and the guide says okay wait a minute and then it's like 15 minutes later 
elevator, no toilet, right? So finally I see one that you put the money in, right? The euro. So I go there, I put it in, I open the door and there's, and, and I literally jumped out of my head. It was, there was somebody sleeping there and I opened the door and I just jumped and I, Wah! And, I and I ran back to the group. group. <laughs> but again, Japan has toilets, you know, train stations, convenience stores. It's great. I remember even when I was in Buenos Aires in Argentina, they're not like public toilets, but they have an interesting rule is that if you got to go to the toilet restroom, you can ask any coffee shop or whatever, and then they will let you go. You know, you don't have to buy anything or, you know, anything. That's what I remember the rule in Buenos Aires was. I don't know if it's still true. That's why like when you hike up a mountain, like, who was asking about, when I, somebody was asking about hiking, was Abraham? Um, if you hike, you're expected, there's no garbage cans like a Mount Fuji or whatever. You have to take your garbage. I mean, you have to bring your garbage back with you. So you always have to have a little bag that you carry, but it's good to carry wherever you go because recently there's less and less garbage cans, I, I noticed. But like in Kyoto, you've seen those pictures. I even took a couple pictures about a month ago. I was going back at night, 11 p.m. I was coming back from a dinner. The Kyoto garbage cans were horrible. They were just overflowing. And so there's just not enough garbage cans and there's not enough service that they're coming to pick it up. Again, if you can, try to bring it home or if not, hit a convenience store. And a lot of train stations have too, but they're very few and they're kind of hidden a lot of times because they don't want people, you know, filling it up so quickly. In Japan, always carry a little plastic bag in case you can't throw away your, you know, like if you have juice and you're drinking juice or something and it's sticky or whatever, you don't want to put it in your backpack like that. You want to have a little plastic bag to at least protect the material or protect you know from, from spilling or whatever right so um another a couple of things that people talk about is a lot of the japanese restrooms and toilets do not have paper towels and do not have air dryers now these days they're more common but they're still not at every place so a lot of japanese carry around a small little towel it's like a handkerchief sized towel that they carry around so when they finish they just use it so it, especially in the summer right it's hot they use it to wipe you know from perspiration or you can wipe, wipe your hands i always thought it was strange though because if it's wet and you put it in your pocket or whatever doesn't your pocket get all like wet i use the mike matsuno style i wash my hands and i just go like this <laughs> or i do this <laughs> or i put it in my pocket <laughs> I'm half joking, but I'm actually serious. If there's no paper towels and no dryer, then you you know you have wet hands, right? So that's something to think about. Maybe carry around a small little towel with you, or you can do the Mike Matsuno style. I appreciate all of you who have joined. Maybe in two weeks, I'll do another one. I think more about communication in Japan and like some ideas or suggestions on how to interact more with the Japanese or set up opportunities that you can have more chance to, to speak. I wanna thank all of you. If you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe. And if you're interested in watching some of the videos that I've made about Japan, shorts and regular videos, a link is down in the description. Appreciate it if you would subscribe. And to all the people who I know who just are on this just to support me, I thank you very very much appreciate it i did i didn't see your question can i convert my heavy license from canada to japan jeez i don't know you can change your regular driving license but i don't know if they will allow you to change that so malik i, I do not know i'm sorry you can go on their web page for any of the DMV, but you have to know what, what prefecture you're going to live in because that's the DMV or the, de the Department of Monaco Vehicle office that you go to. Like Kyoto is different from Shiga, which is different from Osaka. I will tell you, any of you who are thinking of coming to live in Japan and you want to change over your license, because I had a really bad experience at the Kyoto DMV where I missed the renewal date because the date was Heisei 34, Heisei, which is the old emperor uh, calendar system. And I didn't know it was 2022 and I went over. And when I finally realized it, it was eight months over. I ran down to DMV and um, they wouldn't let me renew it. I would have to go through the whole process again or there was something called Kari, Kari test or something, something different. It was gonna be very complicated. if you're going to change your license over and again Malik I don't know about the heavy the heavy um, vehicle license but just your regular you have to make sure that your license from your country that you were at least nine, 90, nine zero, 90 days in your country what I'm saying is that you can't just get your license today in Canada or Hawaii US United States and then tomorrow go to Japan that license whenever it was shown you know whenever it was excuse me it was 
registered, then you have to be from that date 90 days in your home country. And that's the law now. And because I've been in Japan for the last, what, 15 years, for the last 20 years this time, I, have not, I wasn't in Hawaii or United States, I couldn't renew. So I have to go back to America and stay 90 days to do that exchange. So make sure you do that. And you're going to need that immigration form that most countries have that shows, or the stamp in the passport that shows that when you left and you know, that when you left your country, I mean, basically you have to show that you were in your own home country. And for America, Americans, you need to get, there's a, something like an immigration sheet that you can go on, like for your social security, it's the government website that can go on. And you need to get a form that shows that you were in the United States at, for 90 days after you got the license, the date of the license. So right now I have no driver's license because I was denied. So I don't have a driver's license. So I have to go back to America and live for 90 days and then come back again and apply again. Those are one of those things that was like crazy, but my fault because I didn't remember. Okay, everybody, I hope you have a great weekend. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you on the backside. Hopefully in two weeks, if you're interested, we'll do one maybe on communicating with the Japanese in English or in broken English or in katakana English. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great weekend. Take care. Bye-bye.